Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to help you hit a home run for your students. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm super excited to introduce our panelists for tonight, Tom Reardon. Tom taught at Fitch High School in Austintown, Ohio for 35 years, and he has served as an adjunct professor at Youngstown State University for the last 34 years. As a T-cubed national instructor, Tom has worked on the development of the TI SmartView emulator software, TI Inspire CX, and TI Inspire Navigator. Tom works for TI in product strategy and development, and is currently working on transformational geometry Lua activities. He also does professional development nationally and internationally. Tom, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, thanks Mike, good to be here. We're expecting a large crowd, so if you have any questions for Tom, please feel free to use the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance as well as the documents that are being used tonight at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, you can try one of two different things. You could try selecting communicate at the top of the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. If that doesn't work, find your name on the right-hand side in the participant window and find an icon that looks like a little telephone. By clicking on that icon, you'll automatically receive call-in information, uh, which hopefully would resolve any potential audio issues. Tom is gonna to discuss our agenda and our expected outcomes. Well, we did the welcome and the introductions. Um, this is a home run for your students, uh, connecting real world math with baseball. Uh, and it works on the TI-84, TI-84CE, and TI-Inspire platforms. So all three platforms, it works for all of them. Uh, there'll be online resources. I'll have a, a website for you where you can get everything I talk about and, and, and more. And it looks like two of you get to win registration for the T-Cubed International Conference that's coming up in March in San Antonio. If you've never been there, it's, it's a great place to be. Thanks, Tom. And then the expected outcomes for tonight? I right, uh, hope to dis demonstrate mathematical modeling of when a baseball is hit, uh, including adjustments for wind, whether it's in your face or behind your back. Uh, explore multiple scenarios, both algebraically and graphically, so students can confirm answers are in the, sorry, in the quote ballpark, and um, highlight using linear and quadratic equations in the solutions. Tom, thanks so much. Feel free to share your screen. Okay. All right, here we go. All right, so home run for you and your students. Um, I, I, one correction I didn't make in my PowerPoint or the PowerPoint was it's, I'm at Youngstown State. This is my 37th year at Youngstown State. Hey, and what you will get at the end of this um, is a website that has all of this information in it. And again, it'll work on all three platforms. And um, as long as students can solve linear and quadratic equations, they should be able to do this. And if they can't, um, you can at least do the linear part with them. Tom, we're not seeing your desktop just yet. Can you just double check that you went up to share and then shared your screen? Sure. Um, sorry about that. So right now it looks like I'm seeing the expected outcomes. Is that what you intended? There we go. No, okay. So there we go. Baseball uh, let me problem, just back up again. There we go. Perfect. All right, so uh, I'll just show you again, since I said you, you would get these things, you couldn't see them. Uh, there'll be a zip folder with all of these files in it, um, and it works for, on all platforms. Um, 
the teacher notes and plan starts off this way. Um, what I suggest you do in your classroom, you start just talk to your students about baseball and hitting home runs and ask them what type of information they need to know to model the flight of a hit baseball to decide if it will be a home run or not. And in the process of them discussing those things, they're going to start to solve the problem that you're going to give them shortly um, and let them work in groups, maybe talk about it in the classroom. Things that hopefully we would bring up are um, how, how hard you hit the ball, the initial velocity, how high up the ball is when you hit it, um, gravity will be an effect, whether the wind is in your face or behind your back, uh, how far the fence is, all those different things, how high the fence is, all those different things come into play. So there are two cl class examples I'm going to give you with the unit. Um, and the idea is to solve graphically, confirm algebraically, or solve algebraically, confirm graphically. I prefer both. Uh, the solutions for both of these, of these uh, examples will be here as well. And so here is um, the, the first example. I thought we'd look at this together. And I started writing it up just to save some time here. So it says the baseball is hit when the ball is two and a quarter feet above the ground and leaves the bat with an initial velocity of 148 feet per second and an angle of elevation of 23.2 degrees. A two and a half mile per wind is blowing in the horizontal direction against the batter and an 18 foot high fence at 395 feet from home plate. So this is all the information that would be needed to know here. Now, you can do this two different ways. If your students understand parametric equations, and this will be fine for you, but most of them do not or, or study that. And I'm going to show you a way around that. We have, I have a program or an activity on the 84, the 84 CE, and the Inspire that will let the students model this, but still do the algebra, okay? So don't panic about the parametric equations. All right, so what I do, here's the initial height right here, which is two and a half or two and a quarter feet. Okay, um, which now I see I should probably change. Should be two and a quarter. All right, and um, it leaves the bat with an initial velocity of 148 feet per second. So that would be like the hypotenuse of this right triangle here. The um, horizontal component, if you use the cosine, the cosine of 23.2 degrees is this x coordinate over the hypotenuse. And so when you multiply throughout, you'll get 148 times the cosine of 23.2. And then you have to multiply that by t, because that's the number of seconds, because this is just for one second. And then we have to subtract off the wind, which I'll talk about in a minute. The y component uh, is the sine of 23.2 is the y over the 148. So this is where we get this expression here. I have to add in the 2 and a quarter. The, uh, feet above the ground and then uh, subtract off. This is the uh, effect due to gravity. Um, one half GT squared, and in this case, that would be one half 32 feet per second per second. Uh, so it would be minus 16 T squared. So if your students are able to do the right, right triangle trig and have dealt with parametric equations, these will make sense, but most students don't. So again, don't panic here. All right, by the way, you'll notice that the wind is given to us in miles per hour, and everything else is in feet or feet per second or feet per second squared. So we need to convert that. Uh, so that is a, a good activity for your students. And um, two and a half miles per hour, um, one hour is 3,600 seconds, 5,280 feet is a mile. And you can see that the hours will divide out and the miles will divide out and leave me with feet per second. And this will turn out to be um, three and two thirds or uh, 11 thirds feet per second. We store that in F for the force of the wind. So with that, let's go ahead and um, look at this graphically and then we'll look at how you can solve this actually algebraically. By the way, here's another setup for that. So I'll bring up the calculator here, and I think we'll start off with a uh, color version. And I already typed these numbers into, oh no, they, they disappeared on me, didn't they? Sorry. So, sorry, you'll be, be able to see me type these in. All right, so for the um, 
fence. Uh, since the fence is um, 395 feet away and 18 feet tall, uh, I'm going to use X of 2 of T is going to be 395 because that's how far it is. And again, if you don't see this, don't or understand this, it's okay. We'll get to a program that does this a little bit. And then it's 18 times the quantity 1 minus T divided by 4, which is how many seconds I'm going to run this. So that will get me the fence. And the um, X component that we came up with before was uh, 148 times the cosine of 23.2 degrees times the number of seconds minus alpha F, which is the force of the wind, times T. And the Y component is going to be 148 times the sine of that same angle times T. I have to add in the two and a quarter for the initial height and subtract off the 16 T squared, which pulls the ball back down, the effect due to gravity. So let's go ahead and graph that and with, uh, hopefully without me typing it in incorrectly. And it looks like I need to have the window So there's the flight of the ball. There's the um, uh, fence there. Um, looks to me like I might want to go back and make that T over 5, because I think T might have been up to 5. And there, there we go. All right, so this is the, the flight of the ball. This is the um, fence here. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at solving, uh, at finding out some questions that um, we're going to be asked to solve here. And one of them will be, what is the um, maximum height of the ball? What is the, um, is it a home run? For sure, it looks like it's a home run. Uh, so we can find the maximum height of the ball when it occurs. How high does it clear the fence? How far does the ball travel? All those things we can find graphically, and then we can find them algebraically to, to um, and, and use the graphical solution to see if we're correct. So I'm going to go ahead and press trace and press the up arrow, as it says, so that I go to the second graph. And this tells me at time equals zero, the ball is x feet away from me and two and a quarter feet high, which is where the impact of the ball is at time equals zero. And T is going to change by a tenth of a second. So if I move the right arrow one time, it tells me that at one tenth of a second, the ball is 13.2 feet away horizontally and 7.9 feet vertically. And what we have here is a model of the flight of the ball. And to me, this is really a powerful um, thing to be able to do with your students. In fact, this is the activity back in 1993 that got me excited about using graphing technology. Because when I saw this problem at uh, Ohio State University uh, at a TQ conference, I thought, I can't do this without technology, and, and I'm, I'm, my students are missing out without it. So um, I've been using this problem for a long time. So again, I can go ahead and trace. And I can go ahead and see about what the maximum height is for the ball. And I'd say it's about right here. So I'm going to say at about t equals 1.8 seconds. The maximum height is about 55.4 feet. We'll go to the nearest 10. And I'll, I'll check that algebraically later. And then, yes, it is a home run, or at least seems to be. And it's, it looks to me like it's about at the fence, about right here. Remember, the fence was 395 feet away, so it's a little bit too far there, but it looks like it clears it by about, let's see, what was the height of the fence again? Uh, 18 feet, so it clears it by a little over 15 feet, okay? And then if I wanted to see how far did the ball travel, now right there, this is kind of a silly thing, but you need to point this out. At 3.7 seconds, the ball's about 
489 and three quarters feet away, but it looks like it dug a hole, which is not really true. So let's maybe back this up a bit and look at 3.68 seconds. Let's see what happens there. And that's a little bit above the ground. And 3.69 seconds looks like it's a little bit below the ground. So 3.685 seconds. It's about still a little bit under the ground, but gives me an idea of how far long the ball is in the air, okay? And it looks like it's going to be about 487.8 feet away. And you hear this on TV all the time, you know, how far would the ball have traveled if there was no stands there or whatever? And um, you now have the way of showing your students how that is calculated. So we've got these graphical solutions here. And now what we can do is go ahead and solve these um, algebraically. So let, let's talk about the mathematics behind this. For example, um, first of all, if I want to find where the maximum height is, when it happens and what the maximum height is, you'll notice that this is a parabola. And parabolas have some properties. And one of the properties I would hope my students have, realize they have, is symmetry. So this vertex is equidistant from this x-intercept and this x-intercept, okay, they are, it's right in the middle of those. So if I knew these two x-intercepts, the average of those two would be the time where the height, uh, where the ball reaches the ma maximum height. So how would I find the x-intercepts for this? I'll just wait a few seconds, let that sink in for a minute. How do you find the x-intercepts of a parabola? What I'd like to know is when this, this thing is equal to zero. Now, this one here is not going to really make much sense in, re, in reality. That's going to be a, like a little bit negative number. This is the number where it's going to be equal to zero here. So that's going to be my y um, coordinate. And my y coordinate is this equation right here that I typed in. This is my y coordinate here, 148 times the sine of 23.2 times t plus two and a quarter minus 16t squared. And I want to know when that's equal to zero. And you can see that's a quadratic equation in terms of t. So what we'll do is we'll go back here. And let's go ahead and, and write that down there. So I've got um, a negative 16 t squared uh, plus 148 times the sine of 23.2 t plus 2 and a quarter. And I want to know when that's equal to 0. And that is a quadratic where this is A, this whole mess here is B, and this is our C, and we can solve this using the quadratic formula. And I, I realize that students have never probably ever done anything like this before, but it's a good exercise so that they can see that this is just a number, this is just a number, the, the linear coefficient and is constant here. Now, some of you have a program that in, built into your calculator that allows you to um, solve the quadratic formula. Um, in my calculator, I always put in the quadratic formula into my function mode. So I'm going to go back to function mode. And in my y equals, in y9 and y0, I always have the quadratic formula typed in. So you'll notice y9 is the the familiar, the opposite of b plus the square root of the discriminant over 2a, opposite of b minus the square root of the discriminant over 2a. And so if I plug in the values for a, b, and c, y9 and y0 will have those values for the quadratic formula. So let's go ahead and, and look at that. So I said negative 16 was my quadratic coefficient. I'll store that into alpha a. The 148 sine of 23.2 degrees is going to be my B. So I'll store that into alpha B. And 
we'll store that into Alpha C. And so now I'm going to do is go to Alpha Trace where the Y guys live, and Y9 will be one value. And that's that negative value that doesn't really make any sense here. It'd be like the ball dropped by or started from the ground up. I'm going to store that value right away into alpha u. And then I'm going to go ahead and bring up y0. And that's the other 0. That one does make sense. That's when the ball hits the ground. And I'm going to store that into another variable called alpha v. And when I look back at the graph, oh, I can't, don't have the graph there because I have to go, I'll have to go back to um, right mode. So let me go back to the uh, parametric mode. So what I've got here is I've got this number here, that negative value is u. This time here is in v. And so the average will be right smack dab in the middle here. So I'm going to take the average of those two. So alpha u plus alpha v. And by the way, all of this stuff is is um, is included. The solutions, the whole deal is included. So I know I'm going kind of fast, but all of this is is in the notes, all up on the website, divided by two. And so that's the time right in the middle. And I'm going to store that into another variable just so I have it. I'm going to call it m for midpoint. And so graphically, if I go back to the graph and I trace to that value, alpha m, that should take me right to the maximum value, which is about 55.4, which is what I got before. But I now, now have an algebraic solution that I can get to as many decimal places as I, my calculator can give me. Also, while I'm at it, if I want to find out how far the ball traveled, I can go ahead and trace to alpha v, which was the second uh, value where the y was equal to 0. So it's putting in v for t. And it's telling me the y coordinate is 0. It's flat on the ground, 487.3896 feet away. But we can also do this with more significant digits with the calculator. For example, I can, if I want to find the height at this time, I know my equation was in uh, y5, uh, x1 of 5 and y1 of 5. So if I go to alpha trace and use number 0, y5 of t, and evaluate that at alpha m, that should give me that maximum height to as many significant digits as I would like. And then these Student document, I ask students to get it to six places, not because that's significant at all, but only so that it makes it easier for me to grade. I know that they've done the algebra properly. Also, I can go ahead and find um, y5 at t at that value v, and it will give me the distance to travel, the ball traveled. Oh, no, that's zero, sorry. I want Good, good point, though. It, that gave me exactly zero, which is true. The ball is flat on the ground. I should actually be going to x5 of t, and sorry about that, and evaluate that at alpha v, and that should give me the distance it traveled, because that's the horizontal distance, the x-coordinate. And I can get as many significant digits as I would like there. Uh, I can also find out how far the ball is cleared the, the, the um, fence. Um, all kinds of different things can be done here. But I, I want, don't want to spend too much time on this part. I'd like to show you the, the, the programs that I've created so that your students who don't understand parametrics but can work with linear equations and quadratic equations can do this on their own. So first of all, we'll start off with the um, 84 plus CE, and I'll show you the grayscale and then, and then also Inspire. So I have a program called Baseball CE, okay, because I can only use eight letters, eight Baseball CE. And we're going to go ahead and run that program. And so if this is stem behind sports, home run or what. There's a long fly ball deep. It's going, going, stem for the win, and then press enter to continue. 
So this program simulates the flight of a baseball given initial conditions. Press enter to continue. And um, one of the things you have to do is once the graph is viewed, press trace and then the up arrow to take you to the um, graph of the flight of the ball, not the flight of, or not of the uh, graph of the fence. Press enter. So it's asking for all the particular information that we need. And so before we do this, let's just go ahead and look at some of the data. So this is the website that I created with all this information for you. It has the teacher notes and plan in both Word and PDF, the programs, uh, the examples, the statement of the uh, two class examples, both in Word and PDF, the solutions in both. Now this one, the 60 individual problems, uh, that means you're going to be able to give each student a different problem with different data, and the Excel spreadsheet has the solutions to all of them. So let me go ahead and find, here we go, here's this one. And I, when I created these, I decided to look up, I have 60, there are 30 Major League Baseball teams, so each team has two problems, and so I give you the name of the team, uh, the name of the field, and then I also use their home run fences um, as, as part of the data here, okay? Now, the other thing, of course, I just made up. But here's what the statement of the problem would look like. And each student would get a different problem once you've done a couple examples with them. Baseball is hit when it's so many feet above the ground, leaves a bat with an initial velocity of whatever, an angle of elevation of this. Wind is blowing either behind the batter or against the batter. Uh, how high is the fence and how far away is it? And so the directions are show all work, number one. As a teacher, I hope you can appreciate that. Clearly explain what you were doing. Label your answers with appropriate letters so that grading can be done more easily. You want me to be happy while grading. I think that's a thing students have to realize. Include a sketch of the path of the ball from your graphing calculator screen, including, including the range, the domain and range so that they can see uh, what the window is. Also include the equations, describe the path of the ball and the equations of the fence. So first we'll do it graphically to the nearest tenth of a second, second algebraically to six decimal places, and please include units in all answers. So part A, you'll find the number of seconds for the ball to retain its maximum height, and then what is that maximum height? So we'll do it graphically and then um, algebraically. Is it a home run? If yes, finish this part. If not, go to D. If it hits the fence, answer these questions. And if it's short, then answer these questions. And so you only do one, one of each of these three sections. If it can't be a home run and hit the fence, well, could hit the fence and bounce over, but we'll go without that. And so this is what each of those problems are. And there's, like I said, 60 of them. They're all set up for you. And the solutions, and not only the solutions, but each um, step to the solution to supply to you, and I'll show you that in a little bit. And that's one of my favorite things is to be able to do problems that are called individualized, where students can each get a different one, they can help each other, but they can't blatantly copy. All right, so going back to um, this problem here, um, I'm going to pick off the example um, from the Atlanta Braves. So this is, not, in fact, let me just show that to you so you trust me that I'm going to show you the right one. So the Atlanta Braves, here's the data for the Atlanta Braves. And we're going to go ahead and, um, except I changed that 8.67, uh, and I'll, I'll change that on the data to, um, to 9. I didn't want to get into that approximately. So, um, So the velocity in feet per second, type in 142, press enter. The angle in degrees is 20, according to the problem. This will all be supplied to the student. The pulp contact height is 2.1 feet. The distance to the fence is 400. The fence height is 9. And the wind is blowing at 1 mile per hour. Uh, and we're going to do, it's going to be against us, so we'll go with number two. So it reminds, once the graph is displayed, press trace in the up arrow. Uh, press enter to continue. And notice that 
the equations are created for the students. The graph is created, the window's created, um, because that's not something that they're familiar with with parametrics. I want them to be able to get into the fun part by doing this graphically and then solving it algebraically. So again, the uh, reminder was to press trace and then press the up arrow. And the reason for that is you're first on the, the fence and you want to trace on the fence. I used parametrics to draw that. So I press the up arrow so that I'm on the uh, flight of the ball. And you can go ahead and just press the um, left and right arrows to be able to advance. And you'll notice again, it gives you a T in is one tenth of a second. This tells me how far horizontally it is away in feet. This tells me how high up vertically it is in feet. It shows me the exact place of the ball uh, at that particular time. And so if you were a student doing this, you said, well, first of all, I want to find out when did the ball reach, it, reach its maximum height and what is it? So it's about 1.5, 1.5, 1.4. At 1.5 to the nearest tenth, I would say that's it. So this would be my where the maximum height is, and this would be that maximum height. And I would do that to the nearest tenth so that when I solve it algebraically, I can check to see if I'm a so-called quote in the ballpark. Um, maybe this might be a good time. We're halfway through, and usually there's two of us here, and there's not just me. So. Mike, are there any questions or anything I can clarify? Am I going too fast? What, anything for me there? We actually just got a question from Brian, and his question was, by changing only the initial velocity, how does the initial velocity need to be hit uh, to hit the very top of the wall? All right, so that would be a good question. That would be an algebraic thing. Uh, that would be a way you could kind of do it by guess and check, and then you could go ahead and try to do it algebraically. That's not one of the questions that, that I would have, but I think it's a good one. So um, tell Brian I'd give him a Pez um, <laughs> uh, for that for that question. Um, uh, we so have another let me question. Just think of, okay. Good. I'm sorry, Tom. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Let's go ahead. Uh, we had another question from Cassie, and her question was, uh, are you recommending that students do this using the calculator first and then algebraically? Sure, graphically, yeah, I think graphically, first of all, the graphical part helps the visualization. Uh, it's more fun. It doesn't require as much algebraic thinking at first, um, but definitely bring in the algebra later. Um, I, that's the way I would do it and the way I've done it. Um, this problem is almost 20 years old. I started doing it um, back in 1980, 1998, rather, and uh, so it's almost its 20-year anniversary. but. Um, it, it, it served me well. So, yeah, good question, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. We good? Yep, we're good. Oh, okay. So, again, we could do things um, uh, algebraically, graphic. we're doing them graphically. Uh, here, I'd like to see about where it hits the fence. So, I can kind of go through here and see about where it hits the fence. Now, the fence, you may recall, was 400 feet away. And so now students, I would hope, would start discussing at three seconds, have we hit the fence yet? And the answer is no, because it's 400 feet away. So if I go at 3.1 seconds, this, of course, can't happen. It's not going to do that, actually. So it's somewhere between 3 and 3.1. So what I really like about all of TI's calculators is you can change the value that you're tracing to. So how about 3.05? At 3.05, it's still past the fence, which, so maybe 3.03. .03. And so, ooh, that's pretty close. It's just shy of the fence. I would say at 3, point, at three seconds, it's at the fence about 2.4 feet high. Okay, so I could find that graphically, and then I can go back and find it algebraically later. So this is... Um, using the TI-84 color one. I thought we would do uh, one more um, on the color one and then go to the, the grayscale. Um, and then at the end, if we have time, we could do some more algebraic solutions, okay? Uh, but I, I definitely wanted to show the technology off, so uh, I didn't know how, how long this was going to take. So we'll come back to the algebra and maybe even try uh, the question that came up too. 
All right, so this next one is um, the Chicago Cubs, not anything special about Chicago or Chicago White Sox, okay? Um, but I just thought their data was was interesting. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, second quit. Oh, before I forget, if you do use these, my strong suggestion is to um, do second memory, reset the calculator, but only for defaults, and then reset. And what that does is it takes you back to your um, function mode. Um, you know, it just puts things back to normal without wiping programs out and so on. So uh, I, I strongly encourage you to reset um, your calculator for defaults when you're finished. All right, so again, let me run the program so you can see this. I'm gonna run the program baseball a, uh, AC. And again, it's gonna have this cute little start up here, um, home run or whatever and um, try to get that idea of how, you know, I was going to put back, 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 but I'm not sure people would have gotten that one. So I'm going to go ahead and um, press enter. And so again, simulates, press enter to continue. Once the data is entered, press trace and so on. So again, the data for um, Chicago, the velocity of this batter was hitting at 135 feet per second. The angle is 22 degrees. The ball is 2.6 feet off the ground when it's hit. The fence, again, is 400 feet away. And that's not always the case. Fence height is 8. The fence height does change even in a stadium. Here times the speed is uh, 3 miles per hour. And um, it's uh, Bob Seeger, sorry, against the wind. I don't know if anybody gets up at me, Bob Seeger. Um, and so now, here's the flight of the ball, and you can see that it's short. Again, we could go ahead and press trace in the up arrow and see about what is the maximum height and when does it occur. So I will say it's about at 1.6 seconds, and it's about 42.6 feet. Um, again, I can go see how far did the ball actually travel. And this one, it's almost at the ground. Y is almost zero. So I'm thinking maybe 3.21 seconds might be at the ground. Ooh, really close. 3.22 seconds. Ah, nope, now digging a hole, which is not possible. So 3.213. I mean, I could do this for a long time, uh, let the kids play around with it. And I've had kids, you know, really, <laughs> really play with this a lot. Um, so 3.211. And I would say that's pretty close to being about 387.8 feet away uh, at that time, 3.211 seconds. Now, I did see somebody seeing pop up about the equations. So let me go to y equals. And the equations in the program are all done with variables. So uh, let me explain how this is set up, even though you're you don't need to understand it completely, but it'd be a good idea. So this is the fence right here in red, and D is the distance away that the fence is. So every time I change that, this will change. This is the height of the fence, and this is times 1 minus T divided by, and this is an expression I use so that it doesn't look like it digs a hole. I had to get the equation to stop somewhere, and that's in the program, and that's a whole other thing, but just trust me for right now that it seems to work. V is the initial velocity of the ball times the number of seconds, T, that's our variable, times the cosine of A, the angle. And this is the sign, whether or not it's with the wind. If it was with the wind, it would be 1. And if it's against the wind, it's negative 1, because this would be pushing against you. And this is from the horizontal, because the wind affects the horizontal component and not the vertical. W is the speed of the wind converted to feet per second. Even though we typed it in miles per hour, we converted it to feet per second, and then times the number of seconds. So that's the horizontal equation. Vertical equation, again, the velocity times 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 the sine of the angle, opposite side, plus the initial height, and then this is the effect due to gravity to pull it down. And you might point out your students, we didn't have this. You hit a baseball, it's gone. I mean, truly gone, not gone like over the fence, but never coming back. So baseball would be a lot more expensive to play uh, if we didn't have gravity. Um, so hopefully that answers that question there about it. And we will come back to do some algebraic ones if we have time at the end. Um, let me stop there for a second. Um, Mike, anything popping up that I didn't need could answer? 
Uh, I think um, Nanette just asked, how do we get the program on the calculators? Okay. Um, so you're going to get the um, program from the from the website. Okay, the website that um, I created. And let me bring that up. So this is the program here. So what you could do is, I would suggest just download the entire zip folder, and, and and we'll do that towards the end. But this is, if you have an 84 CE, you would get, this would be this program here. Okay. And once you have it on your computer, you use a program called TI Connect. And if you don't have that, um, I think maybe I'll add that to the website. I'll add, a link to TI Connect. It is a, um, a program software that's free that um, you can put files on program or on, on calculators from your computer. And you can also program much more easily on it. In fact, let me add that to the list. Uh, Mike, if you, if you could remind me at the end, I'll actually show that. I'll, I'll simulate that with my calculator. How's that sound? Okay. Good question, by the way. Pez for that one, too. Um, anything else? Um, Shelly just asked, can you change the variables during a trace so the students can explore the angle, the velocity, et cetera? Uh, not during the trace, no. What you can do is just re you can then rerun the uh, program and put in different values then. So if like, for example, here, if I go second quit, and, and many of you probably know this, once you've run a program and you haven't done anything else, you can go ahead and press enter, and it starts the program up again. And so you just go ahead through and, and just um, put in the values. By the way, this is running a little slowly on my um, emulator. It's a little bit quicker on my handheld, so it's not as, won't seem as, as annoying. I did see someone ask if this work on the 83 plus. My thinking is the grayscale will. This color one will not. The one I'm going to show next, the grayscale will. Um, I, I, but I haven't tried it because I don't have an 83 plus. So let me go ahead right to that right now, the 83 plus, to the 84 uh, grayscale one. Uh, so let me change this to this traditional 84 plus screen. And while you're doing that, Tom, I can answer a question from Kathy. Uh, she asked if you can show more than one graph on the same screen, and with the uh, TID4 technology, that's not possible. Um, no, no, the 84 and 84 color, um, you, you can't show more than one graph on the screen. Uh, well, I take that back. You could plot more than one graph on the screen. You could, yes, you could. So, for example, here, here are my equations in, on the uh, 84. So I have spots for more of them. So yes, I could put more on and actually plot them at the same time. The only thing is the fence would have to be the same. No, the fence could even be different. You could even put different fence distances in. Thanks, Tom. So yes, okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and run the program here. This one's called B-Ball 84, okay? So that I could tell the difference between that and the CE one. So I'm gonna run this. Um, and this one here, uh, you'll notice has that agitated dots over there, meaning I'm in pause mm -hmm. mode. So spend, stem behind sports, home run, or long fly ball deep, it's going, going, stem for the win, press enter to continue. This is the 84 color allows you to use the wait function, so that's why I didn't have to press enter in between. Here I'm using pause, so you do have to press enter, and some of you may like that better because you can get through it quicker. So, so this program simulates the flight of a baseball given initial conditions. Uh, once the data is entered, you'll view the graph and use the trace function followed by the arrow, press enter to continue. So this one here, I don't have it, the, uh, it, the uh, um, it's harder to read, so I, I have to use, you know, fewer things here. So um, so for this one here, this is the 84, this is Minnesota, so if anybody's Minnesota fans, uh, the velocity for this one was 110 um, mile, or feet per second. The angle this person hit was 27.5. And again, these are coming from the sheets that you'll get from me. The ball is 2.6 uh, feet off the ground. Uh, the distance to the fence in Minnesota is 328 feet at this place. The fence is high, 23 feet. And the wind is blowing four miles per hour. And it's going with the wind, which is number one. And so press enter to see the graph. And so there's a graph. 
and I, I made it so it looks a little bit nicer here, okay? Of course, no color here. Um, so now I'm gonna press trace and press the up arrow, and it's very similar to what I had before. I can now go ahead and trace up and see what is the maximum height and where did the ball hit the fence and all that other uh, good stuff like that. So it's about a maximum height of about 1.6 seconds, and it's almost 43 feet high as maximum height. Uh, so you, you does work on the 84. Um, this 83, C, uh, 83 plus, um, I'd love if someone uh, tried it out and let me know via email and we're done, tom at tomreardon.com. Um, it's also on the website that I'm creating. So yes, please let me know if this works or if you find mistakes or suggestions or whatever, I would love to hear them. So anything about the 84 uh, or the, the grayscale, any questions there, Mike? Sorry, Tom. Um, no, we just had a question from Jennifer. She wanted to know uh, how long the files will be on the website. Um, forever. Um, they'll, 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 be up, they'll be on that website until uh, Google Sites close, probably. Uh, I also saw another question pop up. Where did I get the distances? I used the, the alley, the uh, left and right center field, left and right field um, down the lines and also center field, but I, they also had them power alley, so I just, I use different ones for each one, um, but the numbers are definitely in between the lowest and the highest for each ballpark. All right, now Inspire um, is, is the last one I'll show, and then I'll show you where you get all these things and so on. So Inspire, um, this one is, is not as nice as the other ones. I didn't write a program for it. I wrote an, an, activ I wrote an activity. Um, and on Inspire, right now, I can't figure out how to get the parametric to look um, um, animated. So um, it, tells, it tells you um, you must enter the values for each parameter, even if it's the same as it was before, and you must press enter after each value. So you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. So here's a page with all the values in it. So this is uh, the Washington Nationals where my daughter lives, uh, and uh, this is number 30 uh, on, the, on the sheets that you'll get. So the Washington Nationals, it, it was 135 uh, feet per second. So notice I'm typing that and then I'm pressing enter. And then when I go down here, uh, it's 25 feet per sec or 25 degrees for the angle, 25. And again, I must press enter. That kind of sends the message of the calculator that value has been changed. The ball height uh, is uh, 2.5 feet. Again, press enter. The distance, even though this says 335, and I'm going to put in 335 again, do so so that it, it locks it in, even though it was the same one. The height is 16.75 for this particular ballpark. The wind is um, six miles per hour. And here against the wind, uh, I type in actually negative one. I actually type in a negative one instead of a two. And so now once I do that, when I go on to the next page, there is the graph, the flight of the ball, there's the, the um, uh, wall. And then when I go to trace, I can see it zero is 2.5 feet high. And again, I can go ahead and see whether or not. The, again, the only difference here is you didn't get to see it in flight. It wasn't movable but you can go ahead and do the same thing. You can go ahead and type in, where is it at one second, just type in one, and at one second it's 114 feet horizontally, 43.6 um, vertically, and so on. So uh, again, you can do this uh, similarly what we did with the 84 color and the 84. Questions about Inspire? Anybody? Tom, so far no questions, but if any okay. come up, I will let you know. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and look at what you're gonna get, how you might use it, and then also let me show TI Connect there. So um, this is the um, website, and the, here is the, yeah, I probably should give you the uh, what the link looks like. So here's some of the things we did already. So this is it, let me, I'll pause here for a minute. Um, these are all lowercase letters bit.ly forward slash ti baseball. Hopefully that'll be easy to remember. There, there are no spaces, there are no capital letters, there are no numbers here. bit.ly forward slash ti baseball. 
and I'll bring that up back at the end in case somebody needs it. So if you go there, you get this. And if you get, want to see the lesson plan, uh, here is the lesson. Oh, here's my contact information. So if you have a question, let me know if 83 plus works, um, find mistakes. Here we are. So this is the, um, if you, you click on the very first one, the zip folder, I want to show you what it looks like because first you'll see zip files can't be previewed and say, oh, no, this isn't working. You download them either directly to your computer or to your Dropbox. If you have a Dropbox, that's fine. Otherwise, you can directly download to your downloads folder, uh, put it on your computer somewhere, un unzip it. You have all the files. They're right there. So don't panic when you see this. This is them just trying to make you use Dropbox and you don't have to. All right, uh, this is what the teacher notes and plan looks like. It's very, very short uh, because the, the heart of it is really on the programs, okay? But you can, I would suggest you read. You do two examples with your students. One is a home run and one I think hits the fence and so they can kind of feel comfortable with that. These are the solutions of those, okay, by hand. So if you're having trouble with those, you can see how I did the algebra uh, as well as the, as the, the graphical solutions. Um, and then these are the solutions um, or, or the problems, problems one, two, three, four, and so on. And there are 60 of them, so two from each ballpark, two from each uh, team, okay, so there's 60. I did 60 so that if you had 60 students uh, in two classes, they won't have to repeat until you get to the third class. Uh, this is the this is the main thing you're going to like. This is the spreadsheet or part of the spreadsheet that shows you how you can grade this. So, for example, um, let's say you're going to do number one. So here's the feet above the ground, the initial velocity, the angle, the wind speed, with the wind, the fence height, the distance, and so on. Um, these are converted to radians, which you don't have to worry about. And this is the wind speed converted to feet per second, which you don't have to worry about. So these are the answers to all the questions. So for this one here, the time, the maximum height time to six decimal places is right here. The maximum height to six decimal places is right here. The distance that the ball travels is right here, okay, uh, to six decimal places. Um, it's not short. It's the time at fence is this much. The height at fence is this. It's a home run. How many seconds it does before it's right at the fence in six decimal places algebraically. Height of the ball at the fence to six decimal places. Subtract that from the height of the fence, and that's the amount over the fence. Number of seconds the ball is in the air number of feet where the ball hits, if it was okay, whatever. And then um, going further, um, uh, can I go further with this? Yeah, I can go further with this. And uh, if it hit the fence, it'll give you that information. If it's short, it'll give you that information. And the one thing I didn't do is, one of the things you might have your students do optionally is, what's the smallest angle you can adjust hitting the ball so that it does become a home run? And I did that at one time, but I, I don't have the data for this new 60. I have my old 55 ones that I had, I do, but I, uh, I didn't make this one. And I did this just by trial and success. I did not um, do anything algebraically here. So um, this is the what makes this possible to be able to grade this. It looks like it would take you forever to grade them. This is one of the easiest assignments to grade. Do not tell your students you did this because they're going to say, geez, this problem took me about 20 minutes to do. You did 60 of them. Wow. And they'll feel sorry for you for about five seconds and then, of course, tell you that's your job. So you should do that. Um, so that's that. Um, and then here is, I, I got to share this with you. This is Catherine Mosier. This is a student of mine. Um, this is actually the first year I did this, but I was so impressed with her work that I got to show you what she did. Uh, it was worth 20 points. She got 22 out of 20. But she, I, I told her to explain what you're doing. She explained what she did. She wrote down the answers. Um, I mean, really, really well done. And then this one down here, I got to point this out. And the rest is because Mr. Reardon said so. I mean, so well, you know. Whatever. Uh, sketch of the path of the ball from a graphing calculator. 
uh, Trace defined it graphically, showed me algebraically how she solved it, um, stored the values into variables, told me where she stored them. Uh, explanation for the algebraic tells me why, why this works. Graphically found the solutions, algebraically found the solutions, explained why it works. Okay, um, I mean, just did an incredible job. So uh, what I did after the first year is I showed my students this and said, this is what the typical student did the first year. And of course, it's a little bit of a lie, but it made the bar set pretty high. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, what I think I would like to do now is um, show uh, how, how you get this from your computer to your calculator. So right now I have my TI-84 connected here. So I'm going to go ahead and run uh, TI Connect, and I'll, I'll and it's the latest version, 5.3. Um, and right now uh, I have a calculator. I'm going to click on uh, Calculator Explorer. Okay, and it's going to show me all the stuff that's on my calculator. Um, you know, let me see if it, well, you know what, it might not let me. Um, let me, I, I'm right now I'm running SmartPad, so it's probably not going to let me do that until I quit running SmartPad. So these are all the files that are on my computer, right, are on my calculator right now. And I'd like to add a, a program um, here. So let me kind of make this half. Screen. And to do this, I'm in the Calculator Explorer mode. All I need to do is drag and drop. So I have a program in here called Baseball 84 hmm, A. I don't think I want that one. I think that, but I'm going to show you. Just drag it right here. Drag it, drop it, and it'll say, Do you want to do this with all the connected calculators? So if I had five calculators connected via uh, USB, it could go to all connected calculators and replace the contents if it had it. So I'm going to go ahead and send it. Now, I might get an error because this really wasn't for the 84CE, it was really for the 84, but it looked like it took it. Um, and now, when I look on my calculator under program, there's that program baseball01, okay, it's there. So again, you get the program called um, TI Connect, get the, the program on your uh, computer, either on your desktop or in a folder, drag and drop it into um, the Calculator Explorer part, and that's it. And it's a great way of getting files on a lot of calculators. Good, good way to do operating systems, too. Real quick note, program editor. Um, you can do programming on your computer. This is how I wrote these programs, using the program editor. So much better than on the calculator, but hey, it works fine. Um, so I'm going to turn this back to Mike, but before I do it, i got to tell you one thing. Uh, I've been working on transformational geometry activities for almost four years. They are done. The Cameron Dinopoulos, the student assistant who did the program, he did an outstanding job. They will be on TI's math-inspired website by the end of the month. I'm so proud of them. I'm so happy with them. Love you to take a look at them. They do require Inspire. Uh, you can get the Inspire software for free and try them out. Um, and that's my plug. So, Mike, back to you. Thanks, Tom. We're really excited to have the T-Cube International Conference coming to San Antonio uh, this coming year. I know, Tom, you had mentioned uh, just how great of a conference it is, and I just want to echo that. Um, there's so many things that I appreciate every single time that I, and I attend this conference each year. Uh, but the thing that I always take away most, I think, is just making connections with other fellow educators that are like-minded. So um, we hope to see everyone at the T-Cube International Conference. I know right now there's uh, some uh, special pricing available, uh, and you can get more information on our website. As Tom mentioned during the agenda, we're giving away to one lucky winner um, a conference registration for the T-Cube International Conference. And tonight's lucky winner is Ernesto Batista. So Ernesto, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days. But we hope to see Ernesto as well as everyone else at the T-Cubed International Conference. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also listed is a link that uh, 
uh, Tom used for the documents tonight. So in case you missed it earlier, you can get it again. In case you happen to be missing these links or they're not working for you tonight, uh, have no fear, you'll automatically get a follow-up email within a couple of days. That follow-up email will contain a link to the recording as well as a link to the certificate and the documents. If you have me watching this on demand, please feel free to, to copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Tom, thanks so much for everything that you shared tonight. Uh, we are already getting a lot of positive feedback uh, in the chat in the Q&A window. So um, thanks so much for everything. Oh, sure. And again, if anybody e email me with questions or uh, suggestions or mistakes, thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.